You're listening to Creepy Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creek Geeks Podcast, episode number 154. Top nine paranormal news and events of 2019. Number five, Loch Ness Eel Monster. Yeah. So here we are again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast, episode number 154, our top nine paranormal news and events of 2019, number five. Yeah. So we're about halfway there. And what we're doing is, is we're doing these little short podcasts over the holiday season to give you a little something to listen to because a lot of podcasts are taking breaks. Plus, it's the holidays. It kind of helps to have something extra to listen to. Yeah. So... So if you're sitting there walking through the grocery store with a long laundry list of stuff that you need to get <laughs> and you don't want to make eye contact with your fellow human being, you got your headphones on, you can just play our garbage podcast <laughs> you stop. really loud. You've gone from wildly unsuccessful oh, to Oh, I was garbage. going to throw that in there. <laughs> so, no, that's not really a garbage podcast. Anyway, if you're listening to the podcast for the very first time, thank you very much. And we do appreciate having you here. It's been a wonderful year so far for the Creepy Geeks podcast. It's grown by leaps and bounds, and we have tens of new listeners, and it's fantastic. <laughs> so so what we decided to do was to go ahead and do these little short sort of countdown episodes, if you will, to kind of get to number one. Now, here's the thing about all these podcasts that we've done concerning the top nine paranormal news and events of 2019. They're all out of order. Yes. So do we think number five is this one? Uh, we're yeah. not really rating them that way, but... What we did was we took a look and we went back through all of our archives. And what we found is these to be the most popular stories, the news and event stories of 2019 concerning paranormal type stuff. According to? According to, it doesn't matter who it's according to. <laughs> according to us. No. Yes. So, anyway, if you haven't ever heard the podcast before, the Creep Geeks podcast, what are we all about? Creep Geeks podcast? is an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the paranormal, cryptid, strange, the silly, and trending tech topics circulating the web, broadcasting paranormal news, and fun stories from our underground bunker in the mountains of western North Carolina. Yeah. So, there you go. That's what we do. Yeah. We do this kind of stuff. And just so you know, normally our podcasts are around an hour and a half long, so to do a short 30-minute or so podcast, it's hard. Yes. So it takes as long as it takes, and we do what we got to do because that's what we like to do. We like to talk about things we think to be interesting. And 2019 had a bunch of interesting stuff happen. One of which is that Loch Ness Monster may actually be an eel. <laughs> yeah. So since these are in no particular order and these episodes are our mini holiday episodes and seasons, greetings to you. We're going to kick off with this one being the middle of our sort of top nine. To be honest with you, we really have like ten. But anyway, we're going to top nine, right? We have a bunch. Yeah. So, let's talk about the Loch Ness Monster and all that good stuff. But what we are going to do is just give you kind of an idea where you can find the podcast. If you're listening to the podcast and you hear the podcast on iTunes or Apple Play Pod. I was it called Apple Podcast? It's now Apple Podcast. Apple Podcast, Google Play, Google Play Music. Google Play Podcast. Google Play Podcast. What else? SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Pandora. Pandora. Spotify. If you're listening to us, Spotify. If you're listening to us on those platforms, we very much appreciate it. If you took the time to leave a comment, and some people have, or a rating, we 
We appreciate that. Yes. And if you'd like to, you could certainly do that too. It helps small podcasts like us grow. So there you go. And we also have a pretty active Facebook page where people contribute things, typically funny things and other stuff that they see that are sort of paranormal related. So it's a good place to find some information. What's the name of that page on Facebooks? So the page is going to be Creep Geeks Podcast. What? And then our group, yeah. our fairly active Facebook group where you get to basically chat with us and each other and share funny things. The group is Face uh, Creep Geeks Facebook group. What? Yes. Is crazy talk. We don't make it hard to find us. Nope. <laughs> and if you have something you'd like to share, there's a couple different ways you could do it. You can also, uh, <clears throat> well, if you want to, you can call us. Because yeah. we set up a number a long time ago. It's a voicemail number that you can give a call and talk and leave a message. And that phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yes. And if you send us a message or call us on that wonderful free number that we have there, toll free to you, doesn't cost you anything at all. And you say, call me right back. Not going to happen. <laughs> Just saying. We do check it, but... It's not like we check it all the time because when we say, you know, broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our underground bunker in the mountains of Western North Carolina, that's true. We're not joking. We absolutely don't have cell phone service and the internet is from the satellite. It's garbage. It's from the stone ages. Yeah. So it's kind of hard for us to get back to you, but we do. And we do take those comments and questions and things like that to get put it, get put to us that way, whether it's through our contact form on our website, creepgeeks.com or through the phone number, and we talk about it. And we do add this sort of thing in there, so we do appreciate that. Yeah. Anyway, let's begin. Okay. You ready? Sure. Okay, so there were some th theories going around, and this is what made the news, and this is why it's on our list. The theory going around was, is that since they were doing some massive DNA testing and taking water samples, right, and testing for DNA, looking for something... Yeah. Right, because Loch Ness Monster, they figured, hey, if it's in the water, chances are it's leaving DNA in the water. If we test the water at Loch Ness in different places and we can extract information from those DNA water samples, we might be able to find or prove what Loch Ness Monster is. Yeah. Because they figured that they could take it and look for large animals, you know, just kind of go through and take a look at it. So according to the analysis... They found no evidence of a prehistoric marine reptile called a plesiosaur or a large fish, such as a sturgeon, in Loch Ness. Which is funny because sturgeon was the other theory like a lot of skeptics had. Yeah. Yeah. And they also looked for catfish. Ooh. And they looked for a wandering Greenland shark because that was a theory. Oh. That maybe a Greenland shark was in there. You know, just looking for a large animal DNA because that way they could say, well, we didn't see a plesiosaur, but we seen a basking whale. And hey, that's possible. Maybe if you seen a basking whale poking its whatever, I don't even know. If, I don't. I don't really know anything about a basking whale. I think it's a mouth. Uh, it's a whale that fly, flies around, swims around with his mouth open. But anyway, if they if they seen large oh, yeah. animal DNA or got a large animal DNA sample out of Loch Ness, they could say, well, chances are you thought you seen Loch Ness monster. What you really seen was a Greenland shark. Right? Yeah. So Professor Neil uh, Gamel or Jimmel, I don't know how to pronounce his name because we're terrible at that here at the Creep Geeks Podcast. Yeah. Collected water samples from Loch Ness. They did some analysis and what they found was European eels, right? Yeah. Are creatures in the loch. Okay. And they found evidence of these, and we're talking DNA evidence of these European eels. They found a lot of DNA evidence of yeah. them. <laughs> and so they're like, what? So it's possible that per, by the preponderance of their evidence that the large creature that they have been reported being seen since, what, the 30s or even earlier, depending on how far back you go. Yeah. And especially if you look at, like, the Kelpie legends and things like that. <clears throat> they're saying, hey, it's probably a giant eel. Okay. So Professor Neil Jamel, that's how we're going to pronounce it, He's a geneticist from New Zealand's University of Otago, or Otago, or Otago. Don't know how to pronounce that either. And he said, people love a mystery, and we've used science to add another chapter to Loch Ness mystique. Hmm. We can't find any evidence of a creature that's remotely related to that in our environmental uh, DNA sequence data. 
So sorry, I don't think a plesiosaur idea holds up based off the data that we've obtained. He also added there's no shark DNA in Loch Ness based off our sampling. No catfish DNA, right? Yeah. So we can't find any evidence of sturgeon either. But there is a very significant amount of eel DNA, and eels are very plentiful in Loch Ness. With eel DNA found at pretty much every location they sample, there's a lot of them. So are they giant eels? Yeah. Well, their data doesn't really reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material says we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Hmm. So since they can't discount that, right? Yeah. They said the possibility of that what people see and believe is that the Loch Ness monster might be a giant eel. And to that, I say boulder dash. <laughs> really? Why? Yeah. I don't know, Uh, because they also found other DNA, right? They found DNA from humans, dogs, sheep, cattle, deer, badgers, rabbits, voles, birds. You're going to find DNA of everything around there. But to exclude or have an absence of DNA does speak to the research. I mean, if... Well, I mean, Loch Ness is pretty big, and one of the areas that they tested, I mean, there's not one of the areas that maybe this animal habitates. Yeah. And, okay... What if it's a large class of animal or whatever that's not a plesiosaur? Means something that we don't have DNA on record for? Yeah, because they never really list out the unknowns. Like, we had this many subjects that match these particular DNA profiles, and we had this many unknowns. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, because Loch Ness Monster, right, it's one of Scotland's oldest and most enduring myths. And the story of the monster can be traced back to 1,500 years ago when an Irish saint missionary, St. Columba, is said to have encountered the beast in the River Ness in 565 A.D. Shockingly enough, the Creepy Geeks podcast has actually talked about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in the 1930s, the Iverness Courier reported the first modern sighting of Nessie, which is the nickname for the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. And they talked about, you know, this, this report in 1933 from Mr. Campbell where his report described a whale-like creature and the lock water and the locks water cascading and churning. Which to me is kind of like, something thrashing around out there. Like alluding to like a shark, you know, or possibly a whale because it says a whale-like creature. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, but is that whale-like creature? You're like, that's a shark. Well, no, because okay. Like, um, if you type, basking whale into google wikipedia is that really a thing i was just making it up it turns up basking shark and the thing is besides its horrifying face it's it's nearly as big as like medium-sized whales yeah it's a big creature um and for me i could i could possibly with the stretch of the imagination maybe this could cause Something in the Loch Ness, yeah. but they've well, ruled it out. I, I've always thought personally that yeah. there's not enough food for a large animal, like if we're on the order of a plesiosaur, yeah. in Loch Ness to support said animal. But the scientists have just proved there's plenty of eels for it to eat. Yeah, but which would, <laughs> if you were a plesiosaur, which would you, which would you rather eat? An eel mm-hmm. or a sheep? Yeah, I had sheep. So, because there has been and reported sightings of these things, of Loch Ness Monster type animals, not being in the lock, like being on land. So, what if this thing is on land for a period of time, swims around in Loch Ness Monster water or the lock, <laughs> right, to do his thing, and then he gets out of the water and goes about his business? So, like an amphibious type creature? Not every, yeah, I mean, you know. He's swimming around. The alligators do that, right? They swim around and hang out in the water, but then they get out and go do stuff. So do otters. Yeah, but I don't think Loch Ness Monster is an otter. Giant otter. No. Based off, the, <laughs> that's actually another monster, like a, up in, I think in Canada, they have a giant otter type monster. You know who would know? Who? Our buddy Prospero would know. Yeah. He'll tell us. I'm sure he's listening. And we do appreciate him listening because so far he has listened to every single one of our podcast episodes. Whoa. Yeah. Because we actually put our podcast on YouTube for the people that like to actually listen to it on YouTube. It's just the audio podcast, and we talk. And then that's another way you can kind of communicate with us. And um, he has watched 
slash listen to every single one so far. Mm-hmm. So we should probably apologize to him. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so the famous picture that everybody sees is the one that looks like it's got its head sticking out of the water. Yeah. You know, and they're trying to say that, okay, so in 1934, highly respected, highly respected, respected British, I can't even say it, British surgeon, mm-hmm. Colonel Robert Wilson, claimed he took a picture of the monster while driving along the northern shore of the Loch Ness and is called a surgeon's photograph. Yeah. And 60 years later, it was confirmed as a hoax. Oh. Yeah. It was supposed to be hatched in revenge after newspaper ridicule journalist Marmaduke Weatherall for finding Nessie footprints on shore. Oh. See, because like I was saying, not all Nessie sightings are in the lock. You know, there's there's footprints and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. So, it's what they're saying here is that uh, the monster caught on camera was apparently a toy submarine bought from Woolworths. And for those of you who don't know, Woolworths used to be a store. Yep. So, you had like Woolco and you had Woolworths. And it's with a head fashioned from wood putty. Hmm. So it's a it's a made up thing. So then the hoaxers gave then gave the photo to Wilson, a friend who enjoyed a good practical joke. Oh. And it so kind of it kind of went from, from there, there, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So 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 far, some of the theories of um, Loch Ness have been like large fallen branches that are floating in the lock, and it kind of has like a a, a piece that's either poking up or whatever. It looks unusual. So people see it and they're like, Oh my God, it's like this monster. Yeah. Uh, swimming circus elephants. Oh, Oh my God. Look at that. Little trunk sticking up in the air, you know, that kind of thing. That's a good theory. Yeah. Wow. So there is some uh, notoriety to this sort of thing. Stephen Feltham, who is recognized by the Guinness book of world records for the longest continuous monster hunting vigil of Loch Ness is not convinced that the scientists have yet identified the creature behind the sightings. <laughs> so this guy felt him who made his childhood visits to the Highlands, right? And he moved to Dorset almost 30 years ago. Look for Loch Ness says the research had not ruled out other animals such as seals being mistaken for the monster. And the presence of eels is in the lock is no surprise. He added a 12 year old boy could tell you there are eels in Loch Ness. I caught eels in Loch Ness when I was a 12 year old boy. Wow. Now, we have also talked about this guy, Gary. Oh, yeah. Gary's job is to report and keep a register of Nessie sightings. That's like his official job. Yeah. And he receives an average of about 10 a year of something being unexplained in the lock. You know, and for a while, he had a drought. You know, he was, you know I think he was getting a little worried. But and they actually did articles on that, yeah. which made me feel bad <clears> for him. So, Mr. Campbell said that tourism has developed around the story of Loch Ness and would be unaffected by the new study because Loch Ness Monster has evolved into a worldwide icon. Hmm. So, yeah, they're kind of worried about it. They're like, all right, this the scientific investigation is not going so good. They're saying it's eels, you know, nobody's going to believe in Loch Ness anymore. And it's like, I don't know. And so, the Loch Ness Monster expert, Adrian Shine, said the new study had provided researchers with a new list of species to compare against records going back 40 years. Huh. Okay. So this guy is basically saying that, hey, we, we, give you, we gave him a list of stuff to check for. I wonder so, if it includes like circus elephants and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know. So it's kind of a weird thing. So that made the news. It's like, oh my God, Loch Ness Monster is a giant eel. And I don't believe that's the case. If there is a Loch Ness Monster... I don't think it's a giant eel. I don't know what it is. But see, we kind of go back, or I kind of go back and think about, if you look at the theory of portals and things like that, and things that happen along the lines, and like we use the Thunderbird, or I use the Thunderbird, for example. If Thunderbird's flying along, doing his thing, he flies through a portal, pops into our reality for a while, flies through another portal, pops back into his reality for a while, he doesn't even know, because he's just a stupid animal. <laughs> right? Yeah. Especially if you look at the Thunderbirds that are like pterodactyls, Pterodactyl. like the rock style at the dinosaur side. They're just yeah. flying along doing their thing. They pop in our reality for a while and they fly out and pop back into their own reality. Because these portals are like bubbles. And when they touch each other and that area gets really thin, something can pop through. See. So if that's the same thing, and if it happens all over the world and everywhere else and that sort of thing, you have a Loch Ness monster. He's swimming around doing his thing. He pops into our reality for a while, swims through the portal, pops back into his reality. And that's the explanation for everything paranormal. 
Right. According to some. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? If you look at parallel universes and parallel Earths, right? And all this stuff like Earth 42 and all this other crazy stuff comic books have been talking about for years. Uh, They're doing it on TV now with all the CW shows and the Arrowverse. Yeah. With like Flash and they're doing all these alternate Earth type theories and all this crazy stuff going because we don't really have TV. So we don't really know exactly what's going on with all that stuff. Kind of the same thing. Fix that. Well, I mean, you have like, you know, Superman ones, like from one planet, like planet number 12 or, or I mean, Earth 12 or 13 or whatever it is. And then there's a, another Superman and Earth 42. And, you know, what if there's like a Loch Ness monster on his planet or in his reality and his, his Earth, right? Mm-hmm. Swims through the portal, mm-hmm. pops up on a good old Earth 42. I think that's what they actually call this Earth. The one that we're all listening to on right now. I think it's Earth 42. I don't know. But if that sort of theory holds true, then here's what we can kind of figure. Everything is real and everything is not real, hmm. right? Ghosts could be the same thing, sort of hanging out on multiple dimensions, different planes of existence, different realities, different alternate realities, right? Yeah. Sort of stuck in the veil. And the veil is that little area that separates one reality from another. So if that be the case, then Bigfoot would be a ghost technically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the cryptids that you see could occupy different realities. That would explain a lot, you know, how some people see it and they know they see it. And then there's really not that much evidence or no evidence at all of it. What if all these missing 401 cases are kind of predicated on that where something can just kind of step through reality and do what he's going to do and grab some people or whatever. And then they eventually kind of wind up coming back through Mm -hmm. who knows like fairies that could explain that too. You don't accept any food or drink from fairies. And if you get hung up in a fairy circle or in a fairy realm, you could be here or there for hundreds of years and then wind up popping back through again. Who knows, right? Yeah. So I don't know. But the idea of the Loch Ness Monster being a giant eel based off water DNA samples, with that being said, depending on how much DNA they found from humans or dogs or sheep or cattle, they could say Loch Ness Monster is, is a cow. And see, I kind of want to know those those percentages. Well, because yeah. It, it speaks to the prevalence. And what type of D- DNA is it? Is this poop DNA? It could Are be they so. only testing for the fecal poops? I mean, and see, that's the other thing. There's different tests for fecal poops, spawning DNA. Skin. Skin. The epithelials. Deco- decomposing DNA, you know, things like yeah. that. Um, I you're going to say Dickensian DNA. No. <laughs> it's becoming hard to pronounce words. But, yes. yeah, I mean, depending on the the set of DNA they were sampling and the percentages, for me, speaks to the prevalence. And prevalence is important in the fact that, well, out of the percentage, 80% was eel and the other 20% was the human dog, sheep, everything, vole. vole. That means there's an overabundance of eel that could oversaturate the results and and kind yeah. of push out other like point zero zero three percent, you know. Yeah, they didn't really explain. Yeah, too much, you know. So and that for me kind of just. Still, I mean, if you, if you look at it, it could, I guess it could be a plausible theory. I don't necessarily yeah. think that's the way what it is. I don't know. These had to be some super giant eels. And, you know, that what they don't explain is, okay, so an eel is pretty is a pretty hardy animal and can survive in all sorts of uh, crazy foodless environment. environments, if you will. You know, some, yeah. of them, some of them are addicted to cocaine. And some of them, yeah, they survive toxic environments yeah. as well. You or know? They, yeah, so a giant eel is going to have to eat some stuff too. And you figure the larger the eel, the larger its appetite. So what is, what's it supposed to eat? Mother eels. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Yeah, you know, I don't know. So that's just kind of a thing. Hmm. It made the news. It was really popular. We talked about it like two or three times because of this. Right? Yeah. And even like made some sort of, um, they alluded to the fact that, hey, we're going to have these big evidence and they kind of strung people along for like a month. And I believe when they announced it, Actually I think it was longer. in August. Yeah. Because they started it, what, April in 2018? Or like or yeah, I don't, I don't remember exactly. They made I just the announcement remember, like, in April. Yeah, and yeah. then they're like, oh, my God, here it comes. And you're like, what? Giant eel? Get out of here, man. Come on. <laughs> really? Just because you found a lot of eel shit in Loch Ness doesn't necessarily mean that it's Loch Ness Monster is an eel. Although it probably is. Who knows? Don't know. I, 
I just still feel, I don't know. It's still going to be a plesiosaur to me, but, you know, instead of, it, it might be like a, okay. it's going to have but, feathers instead of a. Oh, stop with that. So. But my thing, again, let's just say there's four plesiosaurs in the lock. If there's four plesiosaurs and 40,000 eels in the lock, it's going to push that percentage down. Yeah. I mean, it, you'll, you'll. What have. if he's related to the eel family? Oh, that's true. Yes, they don't really say. Yeah. So speaking of what they don't really say, and we did talk about footprints a second ago that had allegedly been found around Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. Right? There's a mystery of what they call the mystery of the three-toed cast. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, we found this on the internet, as we find a lot of stuff on the internet. And it talked about a three-toed cast, right? Yeah. Which later on, they, they may have said was a hoax. So, it kind of goes like this. Um, in 1934, right? Yeah. People were getting, the Loch Ness Monster sort of mythos was beginning its thing. And there was, you know, sort of people saying it was hoax. It wasn't a hoax. Mm-hmm. Right? So, reclaiming the Loch Ness Monster from the current tide of debunking and skepticism. If you believe there's something strange in Loch Ness Monster, read on. Is the title is basically the first thing you read when you read this article. And I'm like, well, I will read on. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, the Daily Mail, with customary enterprise, sent investigators to figure out what's going on with these, evidently, these footprints, these casts. Yeah. And these included a big game hunter. Oh, that's cool. Who eventually found two impressions of a large foot upon the shore and photograph uh, photographs and a cast were submitted to the museum and with the museum they took a look at these impressions and they found to have been made on a heaped up bank a fine shingle with the help of a stuffed foot of a hippopotamus <laughs> so they determined this, this footprint this cast of a footprint to be from a hippopotamus right mm-hmm and basically said that whoever did this had used a living hippopotamus, right? Mm-hmm. Or had he used, excuse me, had this person used a living hippopotamus, the impression would have been different. And the big game hunter would have not been deceived. Oh, that makes sense. So the big game hunter didn't identify it as being a hippopotamus, right? And this guy's a big game hunter. So, you know, and they're saying, well, if it was a real hippopotamus, they wouldn't have been deceived because I'm sure things like weight and impression yeah. depth and things like that come into factor. Yeah. And so they talk about it a little bit and then they were talking about, well, hold on a second. You know, Arthur Grant is, is, you know, part of this where the, the case and the tracks were found on the shore and, and it was in a book called when monsters come ashore. So they were basically saying that, you know, until recently, I was aware of these rhinoceros tracks that had been found, but I did not connect them to the Grant story and assume that they were related to the Marmaduke Weatherall tracks that we talked about in, in just a couple seconds ago, right? Yeah. And so these, these tracks were found on a remote shoreline between Foyers and Fort Augustus. The plaster cast taken from the Grant site were again sent to the National History Museum. But now it transpires that these were identified as rhinoceros as opposed to the infamous hippo tracks that were created using Weatherall's ashtray. Oh, and they have so a the original, of ashtray. Yeah, they, Jared, they, they said that the original tracks were hippo tracks. And were a hoax. And were a hoax because, you know, the, also the, you know, sent in and the, the other part of the hoax was using the submarine model, right, with yeah. wood putty to make the monster's head, that kind of thing, because of this, what was going on. So the question is, is whether the tracks were another Weatherall hoax or something entirely different. The main point being a hippopotamus is a four-toed animal Mm -hmm. opposed to the rhinoceros, which is three-toed. So it's unlikely that Marmaduke Weatherall's four-toed ashtray would have produced such a three-toed track. So if you look at the sketch, there was a sketch done by Arthur Grant at the top of the page, which you guys can't see, so I'll describe it to you. There is the hint of a three-toed rear limb in the bottom right of the picture. So, yeah. what, what is it? Is because it, it doesn't match. It doesn't yeah. match a hippo, right? Yeah. And it doesn't match a rhino. Well, 
most dinosaurs have three toes. Is that true? Yes, because I, I looked it up. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, three toes were important. Now, oh, hold on. It's, that's important, though, because yeah. if you if you subscribe, uh, if that's a word. Yeah. Is it? Not subscribe. But if you if you believe that Loch Ness is a plesiosaur, plesiosaurs had fins instead of feet. But. But a brontosaurus or another. A potosaurus. I, I, I guess. I don't, I don't. You know what? I'm not really a dinosaur guy. I don't really know, you know. I know a grumposaurus. You're a grumposaurus no. rex. That's what you are. Yeah. So. But anyway, so it kind of goes through, because this is sort of a long-winded sort of thing when they talk about the fake hippo tracks versus the fake uh, rhinoceros tracks. You know, the hippo foot made by the ashtray and all this other stuff, and they kind of talk about it. But at the end, it sort of alludes to the fact that it may – not necessarily be either one of those. Hmm. Because there was another set of three toe tracks that were found days before all of this. Oh. It was, so it kind of, yeah, they found these tracks before the hoax was sort of perpetrated. That's kind of what they're saying. So right? if they found these before that, I mean, that does speak to a possible, not necessarily a pleosaur, but some sort of, sauropod which is what brontosaurus apatosaurus yeah. all fall under and they do spend some time in the water but spend most of their time hidden yeah. on land granted they're huge so i don't know how something like that would hide out there in you know near the loch ness yeah so how i mean yeah so you know, they were saying, okay, it was a hoax. And then they said, well, it couldn't be a hoax because it didn't make sense. But then they said, okay, well, the reason why it didn't make sense is because, you know, it's not a rhino track or it's not a hippo track. It's actually a rhino track. Oh, that explains everything. And then it's like, well, hold on a second. More prints were found before all of this, before the hoax was actually perpetrated. So to kind of go back and forth with that, you know, is it a coincidence? Maybe there were some actual tracks and then, oh, hey, let's. Let's do, have a practical joke and create more more tracks. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's kind of like, is, is that something? Or, or did somebody else who's kind of unrelated to the entire thing huh. do their own like third-party hoaxing as well? See, that, that would... Because you have the weather all hoax. Yeah. And you talk about the Grant. Arthur Grant had his encounter where he found some tracks too. So which is the official sort of deal deal. So or deal here. So really it's kind of hard to say, you know, and they couldn't really determine what, what, what type of rhinoceros, you know, because the most common rhinoceros uh, at the time was the white rhino. Oh yeah. And you know, the white rhino tracks look a little bit different, you know, and some of the, the typical track is like 29 centimeters by 28 centimeters. And these were supposed to be larger, like, you know, upwards of 24 inches. I'm just trying to imagine that. I'm like, okay. No. Well, I mean, if you got a size 13 foot, that's pretty big, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah so they measured these tracks. It's like, okay, so they, they talk and then they start trying to compare hippo, spore, and all sort of crazy stuff. And they compare it with the, the casts that were made in 1934 when all this sort of went down, look like. And they can only go by what they say is the museum's closest approximation to the white rhino. And another mystery is that in the second group of people that visited the site, because they've had multiple visits to the site, because it's all going down when they're trying to figure out if this is a hoax or not, because they thought it was real, and they're looking into it. Mm -hmm. They measured the tracks at 24 inches from long toe to heel, and 38 inches, basically, from the left toe, from the right toe to the uh, left toe. That's 61 centimeters for all you non-Americans. <laughs> 61 by 96 centimeters by 76 centimeters. So if that be the case, then how could they make that? That's a big, big footprint when you compare it to a rhino or even a hippo. The largest sauropod dinosaur track measures approximately 20 inches across and five inches deep. It is a three-toed <clears throat> track mark, I guess, that they leave when they... Step yeah, when they in. step. It's, yeah. yeah. Which would be a dinosaur. Yep. 
Yay. No, I I really want so oh, I want a lake monster. I know it's not rational, but see, I really I would like one. Yeah, and they tried to explain, you know, okay, so he used this 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 ashtray to make these prints, this dude, right? Mm-hmm. If you're a smoker, you don't carry around your own ashtray. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, why would this guy carry around a, you know, this hippo foot ashtray? Hmm. That's how they were saying, okay, well, he didn't, you know, the prints that he made, the, the cast and all that stuff, there's all this is a hoax. He can't, you know, he, he happened to have a hippopotamus, or it's either rhino foot or hippopotamus foot ashtray. So he carried that around with him, and then we just... So this long convoluted thing, and I, I skimmed it because it's like, okay, because I honestly, I, I kind of lost interest when I was reading it until I got to the point where I was like, well, hold on a second. It's huge. This yeah. footprint is huge. That's kind of a big disparity in the sizes here. So, because like when they say, did the museum err too much on the assumption that this was another game animal or did Hay overestimate the size of the tracks or, or were these different? but better form tracks from the site. No. So there's, you know, they're yeah. trying to say, okay, well, who's, who, you know, where does the ambiguity lie here? Where does it, but I would think that if you're a big game hunter and you're out in the woods, you know, hunting game and all that stuff, and you've seen rhinoceros and you've seen hippo, you know, or just in general, like maybe something big, like an elephant, but you would probably get an idea about how big that foot would be. And how and deep you, the Yeah, if you came be. across a print that's like 24 inches, you know, yeah, by 38 inches, by 30 inches, it's like that's a huge print. Gosh. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. No, it, and, you know, I'm like looking at dinosaur prints and stuff like that. There have been dinosaur footprints discovered on the Scottish coast, stuff like that, but... Well, if you, you know, if you, yeah, it would I'm have been, sure there's dinosaurs been everywhere, you know, like, you yeah. know, if you, yeah. But, it would have been obvious though. It would have been an ancient, you know. Yeah. And like a fossil or something. Yeah. Like a fossil imprint. Yeah. But I mean, if they're reporting it as new or, you know, things like that, which the article doesn't really give details, the original ones that this guy's referencing, there's still no explanation for those prints. Yeah. Or the, just the differences. So. Yeah. I mean, are the prints real? Were they a hoax? I believe that there were. Yeah. Hmm. Do I think that the other prints that were there or in that general area of where it was first reported, are they real? Possibly. I think they have like a whole bunch of different things going on here and the whole yeah. thing's kind of muddied. Especially like you were saying, who carries around a giant ashtray like that? Yeah. So Arthur Grant allegedly found some prints and then you had the whole weather all hoax thing going on. Big game hunter doing a little bit of misidentification. The, the Natural History Museum probably missing the fact that these these prints are like way larger than what should have been. It's a thing. Hmm. So are these footprints that were reported before the sighting and everything like that? I mean, is it a hoax or not? Or is it something that sort of happened around the same time? Yeah. I don't know. But it just seems kind of odd that you would miss the size there. <laughs> There's a little bit of a discrepancy going on. Yeah. So. Now, that plaster cast was made in the 30s, and it's not around anymore, evidently. So, I wonder about that. And that's probably, so, that should be like a whole nother podcast we eventually do. Like. What? How long plaster cast lasts? No. Old evidence that's disappeared from places. It's all Smithsonian. Yeah. They got the little hit squad. That's where all the New Mexico giant skeletons are gone. That's yeah. where all the giant skeletons are gone. Evidently, with the giant skeletons, um allegedly if you find a giant skeleton and anybody finds out at all, the national geographic or not national geographic, the Smithsonian Institute. Yeah. Institute cops show up and take the whole thing. You know, who's really, Gone. really into the giants. Theories? National geographic. Besides them. Who? Uh, front of the podcast, Katie St- Stafford. Yeah. Yeah. Actually it's funny. Um, when we went to, um, Phantom Fest. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Phantom Fest. Or Paracon? No, one Paracon. Okay. We went to Phantom Fest. I talked to a lady who was telling me about Caribbean giants. Oh. These were, I guess it's probably not technically Caribbean. These were in the uh, 
Anyway, in Aruba, in Curacao, they have large caves. And there has been reported giants to be there for a long time. And she basically, you know, she, um, she, I don't know if she, I can't remember. Okay. So it's been a minute since we, I've actually talked to her, but I watched her presentation and then talked to her afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was sort of synchronous because I had been to Aruba and Curacao and I knew what she was talking about where these caves were. But yeah. we, you know, we weren't allowed to get to them because you, you kind of have to have locals show you. And I have pictures actually. Um, but anyway, I don't know if she was born there. I know her daughter was born there because she actually took her daughter, who's older, with her to these sites, and her, her daughter was taking pictures and that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, evidently they have like a giant skull. Oh. That was there for a while, and now it seemed to have been misplaced. And she started talking about, you know, some of the evidence, because in public, the scientists that were, you know, the archaeological scientists and um, paleontologists and you know, the people that were sort of excavating certain parts of the particular island chain um, would would basically say, no, there's nothing, nah, nothing, nothing really of note. But they would talk to her in private and basically give her all this information and stuff. Yeah. And she's been worried that her information is just eventually just going to go away. So she's afraid, or or she had some trepidation, I should say, about electronically sort of copying things and sending information and emails and that sort of thing. Because once the attention gets drawn to the fact that you know about giants and things like that, a lot of things sort of happen to where the people that know all about it just sort of go away. And I didn't know that was a thing with giants necessarily. Yeah. And I remember talking to her and saying, hey, you know, one day we should have you on the show. And so you can talk about it. And she's like, yeah, that'd be great. And, you know, of course we did with conventions. We just were nonstop every weekend for like two months after that. But I think we're going to send her an email and revisit that. Because I have pictures of her. Uh, on my computer and I just seen them yesterday. So this is, is kind of weird, but yeah, it's sort of a, an aside of what we've been talking but about. Yeah, I, like I said, I think it should be something that we talk about on the, on like devote a whole podcast episode to like yeah. those missing tracks, the giant skeletons. One of the things I was going to mention about Katie was I couldn't remember the exact place. I was giving her tips yeah. on giant remains found in New Mexico. She had New no, Mexico, Ohio. Cause she had no idea that Kentucky, Red haired giant remains had been found in the southwest. Great. Oh, yeah. They're found in the upper southwest. I couldn't find the article and I finally found one. Um, but it was Dr. W.T. Strachan. Yeah. Because he's the one who did some of the research on the Sandia Man Cave. Hmm. Yeah. And that article, it's weird for a while there, it was gone and now it's back up. As yeah. well as. And what was unique about her presentation, aside from it being in the Caribbean, yeah. was that it was the um, the cave that she was showing with all, it had like all these huge like handprints and stuff in it. Yeah. Was, according to legend, a giant birthing cave. Like where the in giant Mexico. ladies, Yeah, where the giant ladies would go off to the cave. Yeah. And give birth and, you know, and then come back. You know, it was just a... Because I, I told her about New Mexico as well. So, hey, you know, a lot of what you're talking about, because she's like, I love New Mexico. And we, we started talking about New Mexico and yeah. where we've gone and all that. And so I just thought that was kind of a weird thing. So that should probably be a podcast for a different time. <laughs> but, yeah, I think we're going to add that to our list. And I'll, I'll reach out to her and see if she remembers but chatting it up. We've gone so. from Loch Ness to Giant Because remember I came back and you were like, giant that presentation now. was only supposed to be 40 minutes. And you're like, you know, you were gone for an hour and a half. And I was like, I was doing research. Okay. But I forgot all about it until just now, as a matter of fact. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to talk about that. So anyway. Yeah. I think at this point we are done. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes. Because we said these were going to be 30 minute podcasts and we're rolling up almost 45 minutes. <laughs> so anyway, this has been... The Creep Geeks Podcast. This is our top nine paranormal news and events of 2019, number five, where we talk about the Loch Ness Eel Monster. Okay. Which I don't think is 
I don't think it's Neo, but anyway. I wish it was a lake monster. I yeah. really do. It's not, though. Darn it. <laughs> so anyway, if you've liked this podcast and you'd like to support us and you're doing a little shopping on Amazon, you can use our affiliate link that we have. And if you buy something, right, we get a small percentage. It doesn't change your price at all. And it helps keep coffee flowing and gas in the albino rhino. Our DIY, DIY adventure investigation mobile of destruction. <laughs> The Albino Rhino, named by contest winners, actually. Yes, and that affiliate link is Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash cheap geek. Yeah. And we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Everything we've talked about, uh, or pretty much everything we've talked about, is going to be in the show notes for every episode. Yes. Yep. That's kind of how we do it. If we talk about it and we reference a link, it's in our show notes. And you can also find all of that on our website, creepgeeks.com. If you'd like to peruse it at your leisure. But anyway, we do appreciate you listening. This has been Top 9 Paranormal News and Events 2019, number 5, Loch Ness Eel Monster. And this has been the Creep Geeks Podcast. And thank you very much. And see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.